thank you all so much for being here. I am incredibly honored to be a part of this Talented 12 class. I think this is really exciting and I've, I've loved hearing about all the awesome work that's been going on uh, today. Um, so I am very excited to have a chance to talk to you a little bit about uh, me and how my group approaches uh, doing science. Um, and so um, I'm gonna start out by telling you a little bit about my background, um, but in reverse. Uh, so uh, currently I'm at the University of Minnesota um, I'm very fortunate to work with a number of fantastic students and postdocs. Um, you'll see their pictures uh, in a few slides. Um, I'm also very lucky to work with my biggest supporter. Uh, my husband, James Johns, is also a professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Minnesota, um, and that's been a very fun uh, experience. Um, you can see us here. This is our first day of work at University of Minnesota. We decided to commute by bike uh, from two states away uh, in Illinois. Um, where uh, I did a postdoc at Northwestern University with Rick Van Dyne uh, and learned all about plasmonics and nanoscience. Uh, I went to graduate school at UC Berkeley where I worked with Rich Matthews. Um, there I learned all about spectroscopy um, and ultra-fast lasers. Uh, and I was an undergrad at a small liberal arts college, uh, Carleton College. And, um, I was a, a Chinese major from the start, so um, I wasn't uh, convinced uh, that I was interested in chemistry when I started college. I was very interested in languages, uh, but at a liberal arts school, you have a chance to explore lots of different areas, um, and so I was very fortunate to get to do some undergraduate research. Um, here you can see I'm working on our uh, mass spectrometer uh, with my advisor, Deborah Gross, uh, in the background. Um, and this experience doing research um, and doing experiments and designing experiments was really what convinced me to go on um, to graduate school and go on uh, in science. Um, I was also very fortunate to grow up next to a major research university. Um, so I, I grew up uh, primarily in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and so for those of you who have ever done any outreach or, or think about doing outreach, um, I uh, really benefited from a lot of the outreach activities going on at UW-Madison. Um, here you can see a, a mid-90s photo of me as an elementary school student um, in a research lab at UW-Madison um, doing something uh, with polymers, and I was even wearing the appropriate PPE uh, at the time, which was, was impressive. Um, and so um, as this elementary school student, I, I got um, interested in uh, you know, the colors of chemistry and the different um, ways that, that chemistry can play a role um, that way. Um, and maybe you can see from the, the kind of dorky mid-90s glasses, um, I, was, I was probably a little bit of a nerd as an elementary school student. Um, and so looking back, uh, there were actually two things that I saw as a student, as a very young kid, um, that influenced how I think about science today. Um, so here's one of um, the things that I remember as a kid. This is a very old uh, movie. It's called The Powers of Ten, uh, made in 1977. Um, I don't know if any of you have actually seen this movie. It has over five million views on YouTube. Uh, so even uh, many decades later, people are still watching this movie. Um, and what it does is it starts with a, a picnic uh, in Chicago uh, and then zooms out many orders of magnitude to give you a sense of scale um, and what different powers of 10 might be as you zoom out. Um, and then also once we reach um, you know, huge distances, they zoom back in. And so in this video, they zoom into someone's hand and into their cells and into their bodies. And um, we can see how the chemicals um, uh, make up some of these really important length scales. Um, so I thought this was a very cool movie uh, back when I was a kid. Um, something else I really liked was uh, the show, The Magic School Bus. And it seems like some of you may have um, seen this. Uh, this show involved this magic school bus. And one episode that I actually remember um, was where they shrunk their school bus down and put it in someone's body and you could see the blood cells and the different organs floating by. Um, and they actually used their school bus then to go in and cure some disease or something. Um, and so, so uh, these are, are two things from my childhood that kind of, um, looking back, um, make me think about, you know, what if we could actually zoom in many orders of magnitude um, look at the surfaces of cells, look at molecules and proteins and how they interact and how, um, especially on the nanometer length scale, um, these uh, systems might be relevant for chemistry. And uh, the reason I think that's really important is a lot of the societal challenges that we've heard about today um, do have a lot of um, relationship to nanometer uh, length scale structure and dynamics. Um, so when we think about um, harvesting clean energy, 
a lot of current photovoltaic systems use nanometer scale domains. And understanding how charges travel through these nanoscale domains is really critical to understanding losses of efficiency um, and thinking about ways to design uh, better solar cells. Um, when we think about human health, um, over 70% of currently marketed pharmaceuticals target cell uh, membrane proteins in our cells. Um, and actually, we don't have a very good idea of what is a picture of a cell membrane. Um, so we know that cell membranes are very crowded and they're very dynamic, heterogeneous environments. Um, but we don't have a great understanding of how the different local environments around a given protein in this membrane uh, might affect the function of um, an event like pharmaceutical binding. Um, also, we just heard a lot about batteries. If we want to think about storing energy, um, the nanometer length scale is really critical for understanding uh, the flow of charges in these systems. Um, and so, um, as chemists, you know, I think these are problems that, that we should all be thinking about tackling. Um, and this length scale, um, being able to image on this nanometer length scale and understand how local environments affect function is really crucial. Um, but one thing all of these examples have in common is uh, these pictures are all still cartoons. Okay, so we're still at uh, sort of this 1977 picture of depicting some of these really important processes with cartoons. Um, and the reason why is because it's very hard to image on this nanometer length scale. Um, and so uh, I was trained as a physical chemist, and so I have one equation um, on the, the slide. Um, but this equation uh, is so important that the person who developed it put it on his tombstone. Uh, so this is the Abbey diffraction limit. Um, and what it tells us is that um, the, uh, the resolution that we can achieve in a microscope depends on the wavelength of light that we use to image the system. Um, and the reason that there's this fundamental limit to uh, imaging resolution just comes from the fact that light has wave-like characteristics. Uh, and so if we're looking at point sources emitting light, um, the signal that we get is wave-like. And as we bring those point sources together, uh, their signals start to interact and we can no longer resolve them. Uh, and so this is known as the optical diffraction limit and it's, it's been um, known for hundreds of years and it's a fundamental limit of imaging. And so with an optical microscope, we use visible light. And so the diffraction limit turns out to be about 250 nanometers. And so to give you an idea of that scale, um, if we think about a cell membrane, that's equivalent to probing about 400,000 lipid molecules in one diffraction limited spot. And so if we want to know how the local environment around a given protein is affecting its function, um, we would be averaging out over a huge number of uh, different environments using a light microscope. Um, if we think about organic solar cells, uh, which are now more three-dimensional systems, the diffraction limit means we probe approximately three million light-absorbing molecules in a solar cell. And so if we want to know what sort of domains are ideal for making a good solar cell and extracting the charges, um, by using normal microscopy, um, we are averaging out all of those different local domains. Um, and so um, one question that I've been very interested in is, what if we could actually beat this diffraction limit? If we could um, beat this, this law um, that's existed for hundreds of, hundreds of years and understand how local environments affect function. Um, and so <clears throat> this was a paper that came out um, right when I was uh, in graduate school. This is from Xiaowei Zhuang's group. Um, here's a normal microscope image of uh, labeled microtubules. So she puts fluorescent molecules uh, on these microtubules. And this is a diffraction limited image. So this is what we would see in a normal microscope. Um, and what she and others have developed is a class of techniques called super resolution microscopy, um, where we can actually beat the diffraction limit and now zoom in um, another order of magnitude into um, living systems. Um, and with super resolution microscopy, now you can take something that would just be blurry um, with normal microscopy and really resolve a whole lot of fantastic structure. Um, these are these crossing microtubules uh, in this cell. And the individual dots that you see that make up this picture are actually individual fluorescent molecules. Um, and so um, these class of techniques are, I think, just amazing. Um, so super resolution microscopy um, was awarded the Nobel Prize a few years ago. Um, and there are three different approaches that exist uh, currently in the literature. Um, and now we can use these fluorescence-based techniques to get down to the 10 uh, nanometer length scale and start probing some of these uh, local structure function 
um, problems. Um, however, I think the, the biggest issue right now in super resolution microscopy is that it's based on fluorescence. Um, and so you need to actually label your sample with these fluorescent molecules um, in order to get a super resolution image. And uh, one of the major challenges with that is that fluorophores bleach very quickly. Uh, their signal turns off very rapidly in the matter of minutes, um, depending on different circumstances. And that's very limiting for the number of systems that we could now look at on this 10 nanometer leg scale. Um, and so when I started my faculty career, I uh, came up with an idea to try and get super resolution imaging without the need for these fluorescent labels. Um, so this is our um, idea. It's a technique based on Raman spectroscopy. So we use intrinsic spectroscopic signals from molecules. Um, in this case, they're molecular vibrations in order to see um, different molecules in, a, in, let's say, a cell. Um, and so here now we don't need to use external labels. We would hope to get super resolution um, imaging without the need for those labels. Um, and so just to show you what this type of research actually looks like, uh, here's a picture of version 1.0 uh, in my lab. There is a normal microscope here uh, and then a, a complicated laser table with lots of optics. Um, and so what we've been working on is trying to understand if it's possible to do label-free uh, sub-diffraction imaging. Um, and I probably wouldn't be standing here and telling you about it if it didn't work. Um, so uh, we have been able to prove that this uh, label-free approach to super-resolution imaging does work. Uh, we can beat the diffraction limit by about a factor of two. Um, here we're looking across a, a glass diamond interface in order to characterize the resolution uh, in our system. Um, and so um, now with this new tool that we have, uh, I think that we can really answer some of the questions um, that I mentioned in the beginning to really tackle some very important problems um, in society. So thinking about how local environments can affect drug receptor binding interactions, um, looking at solar cells like bulk, bulk heterojunction photovoltaics, or looking at how, how charges transport across different nanoscale interfaces, um, we can use what we learned to then design um, more efficient uh, systems. Um, and so uh, with that, let me thank my uh, really fantastic group uh, who's been inspirational in getting this done. Um, we're passionate about Raman spectroscopy. Here's us laying down um, with our Raman theme. And we are also very interested in the colors um, of our samples and spectroscopy. So we have a rainbow theme. Um, we've had a, a number of wonderful collaborations and um, great uh, support from our funders. And thank you all very much uh, for listening to me. Thank you. <laughs>